finally had some hot days this week, and uh, that's all right, though. We're still pretty in pretty good shape. I uh, actually ran out of town on Friday with my wife and went down to San Diego, and you know, I've lived in a few different states, but California is still pretty amazing. Have you been to San Diego lately? I, I, a couple times I closed my eyes, and the, the air was so nice, I thought I was in Hawaii, you know? I mean, it's just amazing down there, and we actually... Uh, watched the Padre game and the Padres won. Are there anybody here that's still fan? Okay, all right. They did well. It was great. Uh, the people were as much entertainment as the game itself. So, anyway, well, it was a wild time, and it was a wild week here. Uh, if you look in your weekend or you see a picture of a mob, that's the mob we had this week. You know, Jesus worked with mobs. He was a mob specialist. And uh, anyway, so there's the kids and workers, and um, gosh, it's just a, a great time this week, and, and we really had a, a wonderful time, and we're so thankful for those that, that came and cared about kids. We really appreciate it. It was fast and wild, and that's the way we like it sometimes. Um, today's text that Gary read to us is from Mark. We've been in a series called Meeting Jesus Again for the first time. Um, the interesting thing about those of us that have been in church forever is that oftentimes we need to meet Jesus again. And those who have never been in church need to meet Jesus as well. And um, we have chosen the Gospel of Mark because we think it's the oldest and most accurate one we have. The oldest eyewitness account of what Jesus did, said, how he acted, how he appeared. Everything as best as Peter, really, and Mark could recollect. So we're thankful for that. Um, I, I, I think today's text primarily is about the naming of the disciples. I looked at that list of names in there, and I kind of got, I kind of had a VBS meeting feel to it. Like, Peter, you're taking the threes and fours. Thomas, you got the fives and six. And you know, you can kind of see the disciples nudging. Do I, do I have to do that? I've had those before. You know, you can kind of see the the grudgings going on and, and all of that as people work. But they don't show any of the attitudes of the disciples. They're just undercover. Just Jesus calling. And he called them by name. And so I want to talk to you about names. Just names today. Uh, everybody here has a name. And um, it's good you have it. We all need that. Um, really... You know, centuries ago, names meant maybe more than they mean now. Uh, people name, uh, their names was really the essence of who they were. They were a brave person. Or when you read history, you, you think of names that are brave. Douglas MacArthur, you think of people that are, do brave things. And, and uh, so our names are really important. And, and in our culture, we really kind of play with that a lot because we kind of, uh, you know, it's sort of an ego thing. We want a name that fits our ego because in Hollywood, you know, they change their names a lot. Did you guys know that? Hardly anybody's who they were. Uh, do you guys know who Demetrius Ghanas is? Demi Moore. Do you guys know who Gordon Matthew is? Sting. Do you guys know who... Marion Michael Morrison is true grit, but they could not have a cowboy named Marion. Actually, maybe we can now, but anyway, <laughs> true grit. Uh, how about, do you guys ever get a new dog? You get a new dog. Uh, one of the best things you do is you get a new dog, and, and we had a couple because they uh, get older and you, you want a new dog and, and we have a new one but the best thing you do is give the dog to your child to name you know why right because if they name it they feel responsible for it you hope they will clean up after it they will feed it they will care for it uh, and, and that's the theory anyway but we know that uh, names have shaping powers in people's lives their names are are really important um, parents, I watch parents name their babies, and I named a few babies, and, you know, parents name their babies, they name them names that they 
will either be uh, beautiful, it's something about being beautiful, or it's something about being strong. We don't name our kids ugly or weak. You know, I mean, strong, beautiful, we want that for them. And, and, and we name them those kind of things. And then sometimes they grow up and sometimes they match their names and sometimes they don't. And um, we try to bring it about. And we try to work with them. Y you can have on your house, your doorway of your house, and it may say, this is peace house. But inside, it may be crazy. We all know that. If you've been married, you have kids, you know that. It's just sometimes not the reality. Jesus seems to do something uh, very strange. Um, and it may seem, seem strange, and then it may not seem strange to you, but he really creates things with words just by speaking to someone. Things happen. Things change. And, of course, if you go back to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, uh, when God is creating, how does he create? Does he go down there and work with his hands? No. Words. Creates. He looks. He says, sky. He says, sea. Dry land, night, day, giraffe, lion, mountain. Name them all, and they become that. Isn't that interesting? They become that. If you look the Hebrew up, if you're a Bible scholar today, great. If you look the Hebrew up, it's those same words, sky, mountain. It's those words we use. That's what they were called then, and they mean a lot to us. So... When Jesus gathers those group of disciples and begins to call them by name, it's a pretty big deal. And it says in verse 14 that he's, he's really appointing them. In verse 14, it says that Jesus was appointing the disciples, 12, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. So, Jesus is designating people. And we all like to be designated. We all like to be chosen. Right? Anybody ever remember being a kid on the playground and they're choosing teams? Anybody else get chosen last? Anybody get chosen first? You were a stud. You were a studette. I know. Yeah, yeah. And, and then all the rest of us in the middle between you studs and, and the, the, yeah. But the main thing that everybody wants to hear is their name called. You know that? Everybody wants to hear their name called. It's an important thing. Your name is so important. Uh, in the military, my name was Maddox. So private, private, and then on up as I gained a little rank. And my name was Maddox. And that's how we address each other. That's how the military addresses each other. Colonel so-and-so. Captain so-and-so, Sergeant, you know who. Those names are so important, and they gather meaning as we go along. They pick up steam. They pick up steam. Because all of us, even every one of those kids this week, all those kids, some drifting from our community, some drifting from other churches, some drifting from your homes, all those kids, do you know what they want? They're just like us. They want to be unique. They want to have a unique identity. They want to have identity. And we all need identity. Today, baptism is perfect for that. To say, who are you? Because I got to tell you guys, the rub on this thing is that the world wants to name you. But so does God. How do we get our identity? Some get it from family. We identify ourselves as, as family. A lot of our names started from family, the John sons, the sons of John, and, and, and all of these names like that. And so you, 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 I'm part of that clan. That's my tribe. That's my people. You know, you get your identity, you, your uniqueness, so you stand out a little bit. And then some people get it from their, their jobs. Um, uh, bakers. Bakers. I know, know any bakers? Well, somebody way back in their lineage was a baker. 
You know any Smiths? Somebody back in their lineage was an iron worker a Smith. I mean, it's Fisher. You know any Fishers? I knew some Fishers somewhere back there. That guy was a really good Fisher. So people get identities from family, from job. And here's, here's the thing. If you were to write down something in your outline there in the weekend or a little outline that we have, a little box, if you were to write something down, here's, here's what I'd say write down. Whatever names you, owns you. Let me say that again. Whatever names you, owns you. There's an interesting story in the Gospels of Jesus, of a man named Lazarus, who was a poor beggar, crippled man, who laid outside a rich man's house. And it's a very, it's one of those terrifying stories that, that are in the Christian the Gospels, a terrifying story, because the rich man goes to hell, and Lazarus goes to heaven. And what's interesting is not so much that, because there was a point for that. But what's really interesting is that Lazarus got a name. And the rich man had no name. He was just called rich man. And it's true in almost all of Jesus' stories. Did you know that? No personal names. The prodigal son. The elder brother. The father. It's not Bob and Tim and John. No personal names, but in this, a personal name. Because our personal names tell us who we are. They're, they, they stick to us, and, and, and people identify with their name, and, and, and we all want to hear our name. Um, athletes. I mean, you, uh, golly, you know, you, you, you could think of OJ, for goodness sake. Or, I mean, there was a time when he was just this amazing running back. We think of OJ, and we think differently now. And athletes have such an intense time because they have such a sh short shelf life. And, and when, the, when the sports are gone, when the athletic stuff is gone, their identity disappears. And that's when we have this thing we build around our identity that needs to not be around what we do. So what all of us really need, and especially in the last couple years, I think um, has just reminded me of so many things. What we really all need is a identifiable, stable, core identity. Something that when things are good centers you and something when things are really bad centers you. Something when you're, everything is love and good works and then everything is betrayal, the same pulsing, center, relational, rock solid. I know who I am because of this kind of center and your kids need that too, guys. It's not just what they do. It's not just pushing our kids to be heroes and all of that. We need something industrial strength and your children need that too. And so Jesus, when he calls them the apostles, not a small deal. Can you think about those guys that he gathered up? What? A bunch of boneheads? They are uh, uh, losers. I'm sorry. That's kind of what they look like. Pharisees thought they were a joke. But what really mattered was not so much who Jesus chose. It's that Jesus chose. And he seems to do his best stuff. No kidding. Seems to do his best stuff with people who feel the least qualified. Best stuff, least qualified. You know why, right? Because those who are qualified somehow miss seeing Jesus when he was here. The unqualified were like, oh my, how can I ever follow him? So, we all get a name, and it's important that we get a name because... We begin to uh, follow. Uh, meeting Jesus is about learning to follow him. Learning to take the next step. Baptism, serving, fellowshipping. We're, it's all these things that following Christ really means. And you know when, when God saves somebody, whether they're six years old or 60, 
do you know they begin to recognize God's voice? They do. The Bible says, Jesus himself said, I'm the chief shepherd, and my sheep know my voice. Have you ever seen a mama in a crowd? I saw it this week several times. And all they had to do was squeak out their kid's name, and their kid's eyes immediately moved to wherever that mama was. Do you know, uh, my, my wife and I have a, a voice recognition. We have a little thing in our car that attaches to the cell phone so we can call you guys and bother you and stuff. But anyway, it, it's kind of, it sits up on the visor and, and it kind of talks funny. It has kind of a deep woman's voice, kind of. I can't do that. But anyway, uh, and you tell it to do something, I say, call home. I, I do it like that because I feel like I need to be a Marine Sergeant. Call home. And then it kind of goes, call home. You know, or something right back to me. But it's supposed to recognize my voice, but oftentimes it'll go, call Bob. You know, and I'll say, call home or something. It, it misses a lot. It calls the wrong folk. Here's the truth. God put such an amazing mind in this human body that a child out of a thousand people can hear the voice of their parent. Don't you think if God wants us to hear him, we'll hear him? Your voice, your spiritual voice recognition, and that's part of what we're doing with children. We are training them to hear prayerfully, soften their heart, and hear the voice of Jesus and hear their names called. That's what we did all week was trying to help kids hear their name called. And when they do, the journey starts. You see, um, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 tells us that we are God's workmanship, that God has a, a vision for us, a life. I was thinking about that driving down to Southern California. I was thinking about times I was in the military, I've been in multiple times. And if I would have chosen, i chosen this, okay, I'll stay here then I would not be here. I'd be somewhere else, maybe overseas somewhere. But sensing God's voice and choosing, everybody else may not understand. And following Christ is sort of an odd thing these days. Fairly easy to be religious. It's another thing to sense his voice, to hear it and know to go, to be called. The Apostle Paul was called. He was called out of religion to salvation. So, God calls and we hear his voice. So how do we receive it? God names everyone. And the second point is really how do we receive it? You guys remember Peter? Um, uh, Peter means little rock, pebble. And then Jesus named him big rock. Rock. Rocky. And, and, and he was not, and rock means stable, spiritually stable. But Peter was not stable. He was actually the opposite. And so it's really intriguing when we come back years later, and, and, and Peter's the one that betrayed him. The rock, the stable one, betrayed Jesus. He did the very things. And those very things converted him over to the stability he needed by following Christ. His sin, his failures, his stuff. Sometimes we think, oh, I failed. You don't know how many times I've failed spiritually. You know, I really should just stay home. The fact is, that's exactly what needed to happen for you to get where you can be now. Different. Jesus has a process. The disciples were nonstop failings. Nonstop. Bumblings, stumblings, betrayals, you name it. So how do we receive it? Well, we've got to be listening. Jesus sends processes. Some, I think uh, sometimes uh, we kind of get a picture that maybe if I'm, I sit at home and I kind of cross my legs and kind of hum, you know, kind of get a Buddhist thing going on, that Jesus will just kind of drop in. Instead of that... Jesus says to you, 
go work at VBS. Don't sit at home thinking about yourself. I'm not dropping in. You go where I'm at. Jesus appears to be pretty busy. And we have been really busy this week. I'm saying to you, serving and following is one of the ways we begin to sense his voice in our name. And he told them to preach and cast out demons and all of these things. He was developing those guys into leaders and workers. And, 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 and he was taking the uneducated, unqualified mess of fellas and gals and turning them into the leaders of what? The church. The church. It's really quite a crazy process. I wish someone would write a book that would just exact it out for us. And I've seen preachers try to do that. And everybody's so unique, though, you know, the path. And so serving and getting out there. And um, Jesus kept saying this, the same saying. If you lose yourself for me, then you find yourself. Our culture is telling you, no, you need to just focus on yourself and then you'll find yourself. Jesus says, nope. You'll never find yourself that way, actually. Lose yourself for me. Let it go. Let it happen. And you'll find yourself. You'll begin to emerge. But not, as my father used to fondly say to me, son, are you contemplating your navel? You know what I mean? What are you doing? You're going nowhere really fast. It's amazing. So serving others, getting out there, pouring yourself out. Do uh, you know what the... Do you know what all the counselors are going to recommend for depressed people, right? They'll talk about your life history and all those things. And then in the end, they're going to ask you to do something, Christian or not. They're going to say, do you help anybody else? You have got to get out of yourself, fella. You are so self-focused. Man, you're just caving in on yourself. Go do something for somebody else. So, sometimes we've got to be wrenched out of ourselves and then Jesus what was he doing with these disciples he was doing a very profound thing just like he does with us he was putting Israel back together he was 12 -ing. he chose 12 12 disciples 12 tribes 12 sons of Jacob 12 12 12 he was putting them back together and saying you guys are the ones this thing is gonna change I'm going to take you on a ride. You're not going to know till it's over. You can't imagine what's going to happen. Just keep following me. Guys, when we do VBS, when we love kids, we are acting out what Jesus would do. That is really the main thing. That is really what needs to happen. He's putting his people back together. And how do you let people speak? How do you know um, if God is calling you and calling your name and all those things that I'm talking about? How do you know? I would say, uh, I, I said ministry, serving, getting out there and doing something. Do something. Uh, and, and, and we know People's schedules are different. I mean, from the oil field to farming, to all, there's all kinds of schedules. There's times when you can serve a lot and times you can't. But another thing is getting together in community, being around each other, um, getting real with each other, not spiritual play acting, but reality. This is my life. And, and, and getting real. The intimacy when, when Jesus called those disciples, he really called them to live with him for those three years. Sleep, eat, get run out of town, feed thousands of people, cast out demons. Just this whole unreal moment. Because they wanted, Jesus wanted them close, wanted them to have confidence in him. And that's really my question today, is how much confidence do you have in God? Um, how much confidence do you have in his love, God's love? 
Um, have you ever seen a couple that's too much in love? It's just bubbling over. It's just spilling on other people everywhere they go. It's kind of cool. You know, and, and, and I got to tell you, I've been married 20, working on 24 years here. And that's a pretty nice thing. It's a pretty wonderful thing. When people are full of God's love, it does spill over. It totally spills over. And, and that's where Jesus wants to get you, where it's spilling over. He wants to slowly remove all the barriers that, that allows God to love you because he wants to. I guess that's really what we're telling kids all week too, is that God loves you, and here's how he did it. Here's Jesus. He loves you. Um, I like the prodigal son story because there's a beautiful moment in the story. And you know what my favorite moment in the story is now? Is when the father kissed his son. <clears throat> have you... Have you had a kiss that lasts a week? I have. God wants to kiss your life. The world wants to kiss you too. It has a lot of kisses for you. A lot of wrong kisses. But God has a way that he embraces us, hugs us, loves us, and we begin, and it draws our heart away from all this other stuff where we would gain our identity from wealth, from education, from recreation, from our sex, from all kinds of spiritual achievement, this achievement, that achievement, politics, wherever you would gather your stuff, more stuff, wherever you would gather your identity, Jesus wants it to drop and he wants you to allow God to love you. And those are wrenching times. God pulls those little idols out of our lives and he invites us into community, into serving, into following. So, we get a name and there's a process in how we get that name. Um, and it's important that we get it. Why do we get a name? Well, because today we read 12 names that have been read for over for just about 2,000 years of 12 guys who would have been 12 nobodies had not Jesus called their name. 12 nobodies. And, and, and so what does the scripture teach us about names? Um, I was really trying to grasp this but I recently went out to see my father. Can I tell you something about that? Just, this is just a small, small little tiny window of what it is to perhaps be close to our father in Christ. I love my dad. I really don't care if I do anything but just sit with him and talk. There is something that goes on between us. My wife loves her mom. There's something that goes on. And there's a closeness and a one. And some of you may not have fathers. You may have lost your fathers. Some of you have had struggling relationships. But I am thankful for my father. I delight in him and he delights in me. It doesn't matter if I do his lawn or not. Although that's a nice thing. It's cool when I do it. But God wants us like that. Wants us just to allow him to delight in us and us to delight in him for who he is. Not all the stuff he can give you. Although he's given many of you lots. Not for that. But just for him. Just for who he is. And to me that echoes the verse in Revelation that says, Here's what we rejoice in. As, as Revelation, which is, shows, pulls the spiritual curtains back for everybody to see what's going on in the spiritual world, that's really what it is. And in Revelation 21, 27, 
talks about rejoicing and it talks about this. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Names. We're part of the family. We've been caught and pursued by Jesus. You know, in our culture, sometimes we say we, we chose Jesus. And we may feel that way. But Jesus says this, nope, you think you did. I chose you. I have enough sovereignty to choose you, and I choose you. And I think that's what he's saying today. I choose you. If you haven't let Jesus choose you, let him. He wants to name you. Your name is far more than you know. There's a far bigger vision for your life than you know in Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for all that you do for us. It is a good day. It's been a good week. We are thankful. We are grateful. We're hopeful. We've seen uh, many lives touched this week. We are in awe of the way you work amidst chaos like VBS. We are thankful. And Lord, more than anything, we are thankful that you choose our name. And so today, I pray you will work in hearts that they will say, I believe Jesus is calling me. I need to follow him. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. We're going to take our tithes and offerings. Everything that happens around here is supported by those who are faithful here.